In National Lead Free Week, Top Gear goes to California, where once again they're setting the pace in cleaning up car exhausts. The next threat to Jaguar's future looms over the horizon, the Japanese luxury car. And we explore the rich history of one of the car industry's greatest names. Hello and welcome to this week's Top Gear. We're in Los Angeles, City of Angels, the real home of the Affluent Society and all that conspicuous consumption. And we're here because they're about to launch an automotive revolution here that eventually will affect us all. This city was really built around the motor car. It sprawls across hundreds of square miles. They've got vast 12-lane freeways, boulevards without pavements, driving everything from burger bars to banks. Southern Californians drive 100 million miles a day. In terms of petrol consumption, they rank third behind the rest of the US and Russia. Yet they've just passed new laws here to phase out the petrol and the diesel engine over the next 15 to 20 years. We're here to see why, look at some of the implications for us Europeans. And that's where we start tonight, back in old Europe with Renault and Chris Goffey looking at new versions of the 19 and the 21. The Renault 21 is well established in Britain as a saloon and an estate. Now there's a new hatchback. And there's also a booted Renault 19. It marks the point at which Renault drop those confusing numbers and go for model names right across the range. What's this one called? It's the Chamard. No major surprises at the back here. Quite a standard hatchback layout, removable parcel shelf and an asymmetric split rear seat. Plenty of room for the top gear luggage, but uh, quite a high loading sill. The big surprise, why it's taken so long for Renault to introduce this variant after all the 21 Saloon was launched back in October 1986. It seems quite a long time to educate the buyers that there's another variation available. The booted version of the 19, to my mind, rather more attractive than the slightly dumpy hatchback version and it's got a better CD factor as you might expect. Under the lid, quite a capacious 16.3 cubic foot boot. It just about takes the top gear suitcases and the rear seats also fold down if you've got a long load. The spare wheel is under the boot floor and that's a big advantage, it means you don't have to unload everything if you get a puncture. The car competes against models like Volkswagen's Jetta, Vauxhall's Belmont and of course Ford's Orion. Now those buyers tend to be rather older than traditional hatchback buyers but they require a rather high standard of luxury and equipment in their cars. And they all come from the business sector, which is where Renault has got to do well. On the move, the Renault 19 impresses with its solidity. There's very few shakes and rattles, and that's an intentional policy on the part of Renault. They've made the car stronger and slightly heavier than its predecessors, precisely to meet consumer demands for a car that feels more Germanic and more solid than some of their previous models. That impression is continued in the dashboard layout. It's got a soft feel top and it avoids the rattles of the rather thin plastic Renault tended to use in the past. The radio is located high up in the dashboard inside the driver's eye line and there's also a very convenient stalk control for changing station, volume and wave band. To be able to control the radio without taking your eyes off the road is something other manufacturers should emulate. It's a very comfortable car, the seat supports you in all the right places, there's a tilt angle and a lumbar support control. Performance is up to the class average but the 19 is no ball of fire and the 1.4 engine in this one sounds rather strained when it's pushed to the rev limit. Road holding is very good, there's a lot of adhesion from the tyres but make no mistake this is no traditional French suspended Renault. It's lost the softness and the roll from the older models and it's very much a, a Euro car ride. It does everything competently, it feels and looks good, but you wouldn't call it outstanding. Changes to the 21 aren't just limited to the new hatch, but you've got to look pretty hard to spot the differences. Mechanically, the new range is very little change from the old one, except I found on this particular example the gear shift rather notchy and sometimes very difficult to find the gear you want. But handling has always been one of the Renault 21's strong points. There's plenty of grip even in wet weather and the car always feels as though it's on the driver's side. 
French cars are currently achieving some success in our business and fleet markets. The Peugeot 405 and Citroën BX, for instance, are doing really well. With these two extensions to their range of models, Renault now stand a much better chance of joining that club. This is the main drag in Newport Beach, just a few miles south of Los Angeles, often called New Porsche Beach. Needless to say, it's a well-heeled area. This is the local Jaguar dealership. Now, it claims to be the largest Jaguar dealership, not just in California, not just in the US, but in the entire world. There isn't a larger one even in Texas. Now, if that's the case, then what happens here has a major role to play in Jaguar's future, because Jaguar's economic well-being hangs as if by a thread on how well it does in this country. Now, in the early 80s, when the dollar was strong, European cars looked very cheap, Jaguar's sales boomed. They rose by over 50%. When the value of the dollar dived, it took Jaguar's fortunes, not to say its profits with it. Even though in terms of sales, Jaguar hasn't done as badly as many other prestige European manufacturers like Mercedes and Porsche. From their 1988 baseline, Jaguar sales have fallen off by just over 5%. Saab and Mercedes are down by about three times that. But Porsche's sales have collapsed with a drop of over 40%. But the catastrophic drop in profits at Jaguar has left them highly vulnerable to take over. Already the predators are prowling around. And worse could be in store because the Japanese are now after Jaguar customers. The long expected Japanese attack on the top of the range luxury car market has come at last on three fronts with cars from Honda, Nissan and this smooth number from Toyota. It's called the Lexus. It gets its name from an American image consultant so it's supposed to have all the right luxury overtones. You only have to look at the shape of the outside of the car to see precisely where it's targeted. Mercedes, of course, you almost expect to see a three-bodied star on the front end. Inside it looks and feels uh, much more like BMW, but in no way is this car just a copy. It's Toyota's best attempt to achieve a higher level of luxury than they've ever reached before. And certainly the build quality is superb, both outside and in. It's the quietest car perhaps I've ever driven. In fact, it's uncannily quiet. You sometimes wonder whether the engine is running. The noisiest thing is the air conditioning. The power from the big 32-valve Viet engine comes on as smoothly as the Jaguar, which is saying something. The ride is certainly as good as the Mercedes 420, and the handling on these winding mountain roads is at least the equivalent of the BMW. On top of all that, the coefficient of drag is lower than the Porsche 911. All that with a price tag that's $20,000, $25,000 lower than the German cars, about $10,000 better than Jaguar. Toyota's problem is really image, to buy a European car confers status, whereas to buy a Japanese one certainly doesn't. But Lexus at this price is a real bargain in this country, and uh, Americans aren't notoriously ready to ignore one of those. So I would say Mercedes and BMW and Jaguar really do have a battle on their hands. As if to rub salt into the wound, there's another Japanese car that's just taken off in the States. This little sports car has thrown California into a real tizzy. It's Mazda's MX-5, or Miata as they call it out here. Came out last March, and now everybody wants one. People are queuing up to get their name on the list. It's all about California's love of nostalgia. The ad for this car says it takes you into the 90s and back. They might have added, back to the carefree British sports cars of the 50s and 60s, because that's where it came from. Indeed, the behind-the-scenes story of this car is quite extraordinary. An American working at Mazda's West Coast Design Studios and passionate about the premature demise of the old two-seat British ragtop spent ten years persuading the gurus at Mazda to recreate it. And that really is where the MX-5 has come from. So it's rounded rather than wedge-shaped in the current idiom, it's front rather than mid-engined, and it's conventional rear-wheel driven. This is not a copy of the MR2, it's a dead ringer for the old Lotus Elan. And in terms of length and weight, it's really just a whisker away from the old MGB and the TR6, who are its real ancestors. The engine is a deturboed version of one of those used in the 323, which gives a brisk rather than exciting performance. 0 to 6 in about 9 seconds, top speed about 115 miles an hour. Certainly not a purist sports car because it's far too refined, but I think it'll sell like takeaway pizzas when it gets to the UK because it's everything you want in a sports car. They like to drive, it's fun, it's uh, very forgiving, above all it's affordable. I only wish it were British. Now, despite the modern attractions of the small and the beautiful, and the current pressures for conservation of energy, it's only a few years since gas guzzlers were king here in the States. Size and power of the engine were everything, real status symbols, in fact. And although now we see them as automotive dinosaurs, many people here lament their passing. So, like classic cars in the UK, they've become major collector's items. Becky Adam has been looking into it. Alice Cooper.
Cooper, Surf City and Muscle Cars. Our image of the stateside 60s. Those were the days when car manufacturers, in the pursuit of speed, shoehorned truck engines into the American compact, inventing muscle cars. They coined phrases like, it don't handle, but it sure as hell goes. Muscle car phenomenon started in uh, 1964 as a direct result of uh, a man named John DeLorean, who I'm sure everyone is familiar with, and another gentleman named Jim Wangers, who was a public relations representative for the advertising agency at Pontiac. Between the two of them, they decided to put a, a big engine into an intermediate size American car. The result of that is the American muscle car. High performance, low weight, they didn't handle very well. They were strictly straight line machines designed for drag racing. But that was the very beginnings of the muscle car movement. This car here is a 1965 GTO, a 389 cubic inch engine, 335 horsepower. That comes out to 6.5 liters. The car is extremely responsive, has three two-barrel carburetors. Um, it was one of the fastest mid-60s muscle cars. Most people did not use these cars as grocery getters. They were not the family car that you threw the kids in and went to grandma's house. They were a Sunday afternoon, take it out, and street race with your buddies' cars. Pontiac aimed their over-engined muscle car squarely at the macho American male, and Ford, to catch their rivals, went to Carroll Shelby of Cobra fame. His speed shot beefed up the horsepower and turned the rather mundane Mustang into a tire-smoking street racer. Twenty years on, the coveted Shelby convertible is now worth around $70,000. Ford did eventually produce their own cars, but only with the help of Carcraft, their racing subsidiary. With chassis mods and acceptance that there's no substitute for cubic capacity, they created a Mustang called Boss. The Boss 429 Mustang is uh, the best of the muscle cars. Uh, it was made in 1969. It was one of 859 made. The purpose for this was at that time, uh, Ford was interested in promoting performance. And to do so, they thought it would be a good idea to develop this big Hemi engine to run in their NASCAR racers. They were never used for racing on the tracks. The engine was and was quite successful. It won 25 grand national races in 1969, but only in the larger Torino chassis. Ford's success in competition spurred other manufacturers into action. The relentless search for even more power gained momentum. Uh, this car is a 1970 Chevelle SS. It's uh, powered by a four-barrel version of the 396. It's rated at uh, 350 horsepower. It's got an automatic transmission, SS rally wheels, the uh, cowl induction hood, it's got a bucket seat interior with a bucket seats and floor shift. I prefer to drive this over modern cars. It's quite a bit more fun. But in 1971, the fun was over. Legislation by the Environment Protection Agency and limitations set by insurance companies brought the muscle car era to an end. Now only the foot to the floor fraternity keep the legend alive. This is it. This is uh, Buick's ultimate bad boy muscle car. It, uh, was one of the 10 fastest muscle cars ever tested. Right now, it's all mine. Uh, I use it for, for fun. It was a limited production car. They only made 280 of them. There's probably less than a third of those surviving. The ones that are around have been restored, and the people that own them drive them, and we all race them. Well, dinosaurs, they may be. They're still great fun to watch. But it has to be said, those big, thirsty, immensely inefficient engines bequeath a terrible legacy on Southern California. A problem they've been grappling with over the past 20 years or more. The famous photochemical smog. Because the bright sunlight they get here all the year round acts on the exhaust that pours out of all these cars and turns it into a damaging cocktail of gases. It happens in cities all over the world, but more here than anywhere else. It makes the eyes sting, grabs you at the back of the throat, and it seems eats away at the lining of the lungs. It's estimated that 98% of Southern Californians are affected. Children are most at risk. They can suffer a 10 to 15% reduction in lung capacity for life. Postmortems on teenagers' lungs, for example, show them to have all the signs of advanced middle age. Back in the 1960s, Californians were the first to instigate the use of catalytic converters and unleaded petrol to clean up car exhausts. The automotive industry squealed and said it couldn't be done or it would be too expensive. California laid down a strict timetable for implementation. 
Now, of course, most of the industrialised world has followed suit. Today, 85% of the petrol sales in Southern California are unleaded, even though, unlike the UK, it's actually more expensive. The result is that conditions now are much better here. On some days, you can actually see the mountains. But last year, for example, on 230 days, the air here was more polluted than government standards allow. And on 75 days, children and old people were advised to stay indoors. Then, in 1984, one man, Mark Abramovitz, took on the might of the administration. He sued the government's Environmental Protection Agency for not protecting Californians against their poisoned air, for not, that is, enforcing the law. After a two-year battle, he won his case, and Southern California had to introduce a plan to clean up its air to bring it into line with government standards over a 10- or 15-year period. The plan is comprehensive. It covers everything from power station chimneys to paint factories, even barbecue fuel. But the new laws governing cars go further than anyone thought possible. The immediate action is to eliminate all free parking, to have no more planning permissions for drive-ins, and to allocate special freeway lanes for shared or pooled vehicles. By 1993, all official bodies are to change from petrol or diesel engines to clean fuel. And by 1999, 40% of cars, 70% of trucks and all buses are to run on a clean fuel. The pooled cars idea has already caught on. In most areas, lanes on the freeway have been set aside for cars carrying two or more people. The incentive being, of course, that they can thus beat the jams. Companies employing 100 people or more have to reduce the number of car journeys their employees make to work and the penalties for non-compliance are really quite severe. We do have the authority to impose a $25,000 a day or a year in jail fine. Now, we hope we're not going to have to do that, but we have fined companies who haven't submitted a plan letting us know how they're, they're going to reduce the number of vehicles driving to work at their site in the morning. So are employers in California generally taking that, uh, that regulation seriously? I think so. We've seen some really good plans come up from, from companies around the basin. Incentives such as a four-day work week, 10-hour day, flexible hours, or telecommuting, which is basically working at home. Anything to reduce the number of vehicles that they have coming into the workforce. Well, as you might expect, those demands have really set the cut among the pigeons. There are those who argue they should be tougher and go further faster, while the car industry, for example, is already implying they can't be achieved. But things are really moving here. Edison, as you might expect, is making a big play for electric vehicles. But they have to carry 36 batteries, can only do a 60-mile day on an eight-hour charge. They may, however, have their niche. But the biggest developments have been made with propane and methanol-powered vehicles. Orange County Transit, for example, have been using propane-propelled buses for four or five years now. They find lower maintenance costs, a better performance, and the fuel costs only half as much as diesel. Methanol is the other big front-runner. It's easy to produce from natural gas and burns clean. And Ford and GM have supplied 5,000 experimental vehicles for use in LA. It has its problems. It's more expensive than petrol, requires bigger fuel tanks. Above all, it requires the oil companies to set up a nationwide distribution system. But George Bush has made it quite clear where he wants things to go. A half a million flexible fueled cars able to use either petrol or methanol by 1995. There's even an idea for the state to buy up all the big old heavily polluting cars in one fell swoop and scrap the lot. But how do Californians in general feel about the plan? There's widespread support for this plan. It did take uh, pressure groups to mobilize that support, but the public has long made it clear that they want clean air. But if it were to go to a referendum, for example, would it be, uh, would it be voted in? Yes, I believe that it would. Um, repeatedly, the public has listed air pollution control as one of the three top priorities, along with crime and drugs. There are lots of Californians in positions of power who believe the cost is too great. We don't believe that air quality is the only issue that has to be considered. We believe that it's one goal among many and that you need a balanced approach towards solving the problems that we have in Southern California. And therefore, cost is a relevant consideration. We don't want to clean up the air at the expense of mass unemployment. There is no doubt that what California is planning to do is genuinely a revolution, bringing to an end the hundred-year domination of the petrol engine. No wonder some politicians and some big vested interests are squirming a bit. But the general view here seems to be the plan will go through, albeit with some modifications. There's strong support here for what they call technology-forcing law. And if we look at our experience with catalytic converters and lead-free petrol, it seems clear that as changes take place here in the Golden State, eventually the rest of the world follows suit, and that, of course, means us. Now, from a glimpse of the future here in California to a gaze at the past, back across the water in France, where Chris has been looking at the long and varied history of the name Peugeot. Peugeot 
Sochaux's brand new museum in Sochaux, eastern France, celebrates more than just cars because since 1810 the Peugeot family had been running a general manufacturing company making everything from sewing machines to coffee grinders. Now the odds are that this lady cyclist was wearing a Peugeot corset because the brothers made the steel inserts for those garments. They look very much like bicycle spokes and of course the brothers started making bicycles themselves and that involved them in the embryonic car industry. This was one of their most famous bikes, it's the Grand B of 1882. Peugeot's first cars clearly showed their origins in the cycle and coachwork business. This 1892 vis-a-vis -vis had a meticulously detailed paint job and all the early models had a tubular chassis which also carried the cooling water. By the end of the 19th century, Peugeot were already demonstrating their reputation for durability by winning endurance races. In 1895, for instance, this Type 3 won a race from Paris all the way down to Bordeaux and then back again, averaging 13 and a half miles an hour. But by the turn of the century, the Surrey with a fringe on top look was already becoming dated and Peugeot were having to revise their ideas of always having the engine in the back to spare the passengers the fumes from the early engines. After 1901, a more elegant range of front-engine cars was developed, but their higher prices caused the family to split up. One brother, Robert, left to build cheaper cars under the Lion Badge in Lille. The basic but quite attractive Taurus weren't well liked, and the company wasn't a success. It took the development of a much-copied racing car, which caused a stir when it won at Indianapolis in 1916, and a Bugatti-designed cycle car, the Bebe, to bring the family back together. The Quadrilette of 1921 developed the cycle car theme further. Journeys in the Quadrilette were supposed to be cheaper than a third-class rail fare, but the width of only 1.2 metres meant a few compromises in seat comfort. But Peugeot's larger cars were sold not on their economy, but their toughness. It was in the 30s that Peugeot started the principle of calling their models after a three-digit number with a zero in the middle. The two and four series cars were particularly popular. This 1935 402 Peugeot is a perfect example that there's nothing new under the sun in the motor industry. Even in 1935 they were very concerned with aerodynamics and this car was actually styled with the assistance of a, a very primitive wind tunnel. One of the first things they discovered was the traditional place for headlamps out here on the wings caused an awful lot of air turbulence, so they moved them inside and put them under the radiator grill. And they carefully sculpted the side of the car so the air would flow over the front wings, and they filled in the traditional rear wheel arch as well, just to smooth the airflow through the whole car. Inside, it's truly luxurious with this enormous bench seat and because the gear change is up here on the dashboard like the Citroen Traxion there's no interruption to the passenger's feet and you can really squash up in comfort. Of course the French very concerned with ventilation forget your face level twist vents you actually open the windscreen like this and that I can assure you gave you a lovely rush of air on the route nationales. The company survived the recession and the 30s firmly established them as a mass car manufacturer. Although not as bold as Citroen, the improved fortunes left Peugeot with some room for adventurous experiments. The 1930s saw a passion for convertibles and it seemed that every saloon car had its ragtop equivalent. But the 402 Eclipse in 1935 literally stole the Paris show for the way that they converted this apparently solid saloon into a convertible. The whole back end hinged up and then the roof lifted on counterbalances and sunk down. Didn't leave you an awful lot of room for luggage, mind you, and you could even have it electrically operated. It was an idea that Ford were to take up in the mid-50s with their Skyliner. 
After the war, Peugeot produced a real winner. The 203 became one of the most popular cars of its time. It was joined by the 403 in 1955, the first Peugeot to be styled by Pininfarina, but it did little to remove the company's rather staid reputation. Rally victories had to wait for its successor, the 404. This example won the East African Safari in 1966 and 67, driven by the redoubtable Bert Shankland. And one other thing you could always rely on the tough old Peugeot to do, and that was to pull through the mud of the safari, but the navigator had to do a lot more than just sit inside and read the maps. He had to get on the back and bounce. Rallying has in fact been Peugeot's touchstone in their quest for a completely different image, and how they've succeeded in events like this, a record-breaking run up the fearsome American mountain track, Pikes Peak. Today, Peugeot's new factory in Sochaux produces the latest model, the 605 Executive Saloon. But the company hasn't forgotten its heritage and its roots. And it's nice to see their determination to ensure that every car in the museum is a runner. Well, that's all this week from California, indeed from Malibu Beach, one of the playgrounds of the privileged in this richly endowed state. California has probably bequeathed more fads and fashions to the US than any other state. But when they really want something here, they seem to have the ability and the will to drive it through to the end. And they really want cleaner air. Now, for news of next week's program, let me hand you back across the water where Tony Mason has been following the revival of the Tour of Britain. Well, here I am at this famous hangar at Cardington, Bedfordshire, once home of the huge airships of the 1930s. Today it's the starting point of the Autoglass Tour, a 2,000 mile thrash throughout the British Isles. The first car was flagged away by Virginia Bottomley, Junior Environment Minister, no doubt persuaded to take part because all the cars are running on unleaded petrol. The route combines circuit racing, rally stages and the occasional auto test and hill climbs. The idea was that the event should appeal to both race and rally drivers, but the thin entry of 25 cars was dominated by rally men. Jimmy McRae led from the start, but was harried by Roger Clark. He was persuaded out of retirement at the last minute to substitute for a sick Johnny Herbert, the only Formula One driver tempted to take part. Derek Bell was one of several drivers entertaining a succession of navigators, and if he keeps it all in one piece, I'll be alongside him on Saturday. So join us next Thursday for a full report of the Autoglass Tour, plus a road test on the new Skoda Favorite. Until then, from all of us on Top Gear, good night and drive safely.